Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving of your son, that you would crush him, that his blood would be shed on our behalf, as we've seen last week, and as we know from First Peter, it was precious blood that we have been purchased with, spotless, blameless lamb, the lamb of God, Christ. Because he was willing to lay his life down, we have been given new life. Because he was willing to be crushed by the Father, we have peace with you. And Lord, we don't ever want to take lightly the forgiveness of sins that we have been given. We don't ever want to think small of the cost that it took. And Lord, we never want to respond with triteness to the salvation that you've given to us and the new life that we have in you. And so help us, Father, to think rightly about the tremendous gift of our salvation and our identity in Christ as redeemed ones, saved ones. Help us to desire above all else to be used for your glory and for your purposes and help us to have hearts of humility that are eager to submit to your instruction and your will that we would be found useful for your glory. Lord, this evening as we continue to look at your word from 1 Peter, Lord, we pray that you would use this time uniquely to make us more like Jesus. Increase our love. Increase our zeal and our passion for you. Help us to be faithful. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please open your Bible to the book of 1 Peter. Chapter 1, we are finishing up chapter 1 of this rich, rich, rich letter that we have begun making our way through, and Peter has given us so much already just in the first chapter, so much that directly intersects with our lives, directly impacts, even just at a practical level, comprehensively how we live our life. And as we wrap up this first chapter, he's going to address something that is both to be a staple of the Christian life and one of the highest calls for the follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, this in many ways is to be a defining characteristic for the Christian And not just certain Christians, it's not that some have been called for this task or for this purpose, but each one of us who names the name of Christ, who claims to love Jesus, who has been redeemed by the precious blood that Peter just described, each of us is called to this virtue, and it is to love one another. R.C. Sproul, referencing the 16th century Reformation, notes that the phrase Coram Deo was the rallying cries for those who sought to be faithful to God. It literally means before the face of God. And it captures the idea that although we cannot see God visibly, he can see us every single moment of every single day. We live our lives before his face at all times. There's a temptation for each one of us to straighten up when in the presence of those we fear or those who hold authority over us. Children, you realize mom and dad walk into the room and all of a sudden the way that you are talking to your sibling changes drastically. So we've heard that that happens. Maybe you're at work speaking with a coworker, and there's a, a casualness to your speech until your manager walks in and all of a sudden the conversation gets real awkward. Yet the reality is God sees and God hears every action, every word we speak, every disposition of the heart. There's nothing hidden from him. He is always privy to everything that goes on in each one of our lives. Peter has been speaking to help us realize this perpetual presence of God and the impact that it must have on our lives. We live every moment before the face of God. 
and we live every moment under the sovereignty of God and are called to live every moment for the glory of God. We are perpetually to live under his authority and for his glory. And recognizing that everything we do is before his face, it actually aids us in accomplishing those purposes. And so as we seek to live faithfully the Christian life, we must recognize the perpetual presence of the Lord. Peter has been helping us by pointing out several realities behind the commands that he's given so that we recognize the perpetual presence of the Lord in our conduct. He called us to live in light of the future certain hope, reflects a confidence in the salvation work that Jesus has accomplished, and it brings perspective beyond the moment to live for eternity. And he called us to live holy lives as our heavenly Father is holy, to imitate him, be holy as I am holy. To live also in reverential fear, and this goes along with recognizing that we live our lives before the face of God. He is always present, and we recognize his divine authority over us. We are his child, We are the child of the one who judges impartially, and yet he provided a way for us through his son's precious blood. These are all the call for the Christian. We know that Peter started the book praising God for his regenerating work in the believer, making them new creations, and with his instruction has come reminder after reminder about your identity in Christ, what God has done for you. And with his instruction has come these reminders of God's work in the gospel and how that is to impact our living. And we're seeing this direct connection between the Christian's identity under God's saving grace, how we should think about that, and how that impacts us at the practical living level. Your practical life of godliness will only rise to the depth of your understanding and belief in what God has done and who he is. We are called to renew our minds with these truths. Where our mind goes, we will go. And so remember your salvation, remember God, live in reverential fear of him. And when you're embracing your identity as a child of obedience and recognizing the presence of your Holy Father in all things, what does this kind of thinking produce? What does this kind of life produce? What flows out of one who is practicing practicing this discipline of mind renewal and self-control of the mind regularly? Peter tells us through instruction, as it is to produce, love for others. One who recognizes the gift of salvation that they have received in Christ, one who lives in light of eternity, one who lives a holy life as God is holy, one who lives in reverential fear, has a firm foundation of thinking to then launch them in to Christ-like love for one another. That's the next instruction that Peter is going to give for us. Let's read our passage and we'll see this unfold again this evening. 1 Peter chapter 1 Verses 22 through 25. Peter says, Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Peter gives two reminders that stimulate love for one another. Two reminders that stimulate love love for one another. There's a direct command in verse 22, the second half of verse 22, to fervently love one another from the heart. Again, Peter keeps doing this. He gives a specific, emphatic command for the Christian, and he surrounds it with aids or motivators or reminders that enhance and help us in our obedience to this primary command. So Peter gives two reminders that are to stimulate us, they spur us, they motivate us to this love for one another that we as Christians are to possess. 
And this is now the fourth time that Peter's given one primary command and surrounded it with aids to help us in our obedience to the command. And these reminders are so helpful, helpful for us in our pursuit of obedience to these commands as we consider the command, the call to love one another. These reminders are especially impactful because we know the natural tendency for each one of us is not selfless love, but rather the natural tendency that is found in each one of us, this is, this is universally true, is self-love. Love of self. Each one of us, apart from the work of Christ in us, naturally views life through the lens of self. My schedule, my priorities, my commitments, my obligations, my needs, my desires, my expectations, and so on. So much so that we can view the Christian life as a giant disappointment because others just aren't living up to our expectations. They're just not meeting it when it comes to what we need or what we want. So we distance ourselves from others. I distance myself from the church or never settle into the church because I can always find something wrong with those around me who aren't meeting my needs, aren't living up to God's call as I see it. And how many have been hurt by the church, have been hurt by those in the church, and then actually find themselves embittered to the bride of Christ, embittered to the church, separated from the body of Christ because they can't get past themselves, their own hurt, to persist in love for others in the church. It's tragic. It's heartbreaking. It's devastating to the Christian life when this happens. Not loving others is our natural inclination. And if you remember these early believers, they are facing severe Adversity, very real trials, hardships are compressing in on them. The human heart is prone to self-love, self-focus, self-worship, and this is only exasperated when in the midst of trials, like narrowing blinders on a horse. Our field of view when facing trials or hardships, it just gets more and more narrow and we get fixated on how everything is impacting us. Is that not true for you? I know I've been there. My schedule gets full, demands on my life get high, my service to my family decreases. My eagerness to serve others around me, I need to set that aside. Look at all that I have to do. Self-focused, self-preserving, that is our natural inclination in trials and hardships, much less just the day in and day out of life. And this self-focus is in direct opposition to the call, to the command to love one another. To love one another actually demands, it requires self-denial. And so this focus on self leads us to not love others as opposed to fearing God. We rather fear our circumstances. And in those moments, we don't trust God. We don't trust his sovereign providence. And we want to control others. We want to control our circumstances. We want to manipulate things around us to get what we want that we think is good for us. That's our natural tendency. And so Peter, knowing this tendency of the flesh, gives this instruction with reminders that aid us. It, it, they aid the believer in walking in love. This is what we're called to, regardless of our circumstances in life. Look at the second half of verse 22. Peter says, fervently love one another from the heart. That's the command in this passage. Every single Christian is called to fervently love one another from heart the heart. We'll talk about the words fervently and from the heart in a moment, but first, I want to talk about what it means to love one another just at its most basic form. To love someone else. What does it mean to love someone else? It is to seek the highest good for another 
regardless of the personal cost. Love one another. Seek the highest good for another regardless of personal cost. To love one another as God calls us to is to be committed, to be devoted to one another's good, one another's benefit before the Lord. We're not talking about temporal, earthly good or fleshly good. We're talking about good as God defines it. To be a spiritual blessing to one another regardless, regardless of what it costs you. You are eager to care and encourage and help and serve those around you. You aren't preoccupied with the cost to yourself. Oh, they need, they need help. Oh, but this, I don't know if I can, I just don't know if I can do that. I got a lot going on. You aren't preoccupied with the effects of that pouring out for the other's good. You're eager to step in, to, to care for one another, to encourage, to serve. And this isn't just cost in relation to money, but your time and your resources, even the, the mental attention that you must give to care for another. You just aren't preoccupied with self. This is like humility, not thinking less about yourself, but thinking about yourself far less. Don't think about yourself. To love one another, it doesn't even weigh as if it matters the cost to yourself. You just want to give. You have opportunity to bless another. You love. You're committed to others' good. You're eager to jump at the opportunity to provide and be a blessing and encourage others. And the call is for each individual to do this with all individuals in the body. It's extreme. This is a reciprocal commitment to loving each other in the body of Christ. What does that mean for our proximity? If we're called to love one another and this love for one another is to be committed to each other's good regardless of the cost, what does that mean to how close we are to be with one another? Well, we aren't to keep one another at a distance. To love well means you let down personal guards that are put up for fear of people maybe finding out what you're really like or what's really going on or I don't want to be transparent. I don't want to get too close because I've been hurt in the past and I might get hurt again. Who's the focus of those kinds of statements? You are. God calls you to take your eyes off of yourself and to give of yourself for others' good, even if that means being vulnerable. And the guarantee is not that you won't get hurt again. But what is a momentary hurt compared to a, an eternal treasure? God calls us to do this. It glorifies God. He rewards faithfulness in these things. And so we love and we submit and we obey God and we trust Christ. He uses flawed individuals connected with other flawed individuals to build up his church in love to glorify his, his name. That's his wisdom. We need to be connected with one another. To be what God intends in the body of Christ, it takes sacrifice. It comes at a cost. Being at church, engaging in relationships, praying for one another, interacting with one another so you know how to pray for one another, being available when there's needs, all of these things take away from other things that you may enjoy and value. Yes, it comes at a cost, but it's still what we're called to. It's what God intends the body of Christ to be. It, it comes at personal cost to be connected with one another. And yet the church has never been intended nor designed by God to be simply consumeristic, as if this is all here for you. That's not God's intention. You come, enjoy the show, get recharged, go on with your life. That in many ways has become American evangelicalism. And it is tragic. 
because it is not God's intention for the church. We are being built one with another into a holy temple, the body of Christ. For that to happen as God intends, there has to be intentional connection with one another. The church is not designed by God to be consumeristic, individualistic. It's not something you simply show up to and leave. You don't go to church. We are the church. We are the church. And listen, that is way more impressive and way more precious than an hour and a half production that you get to experience each week. You are part of the body of Christ if you are in Christ. This manifests itself in Christ-like love for one another. As we are the church, we love one another like Christ. We seek each other's good. That is God's design for the church. You may be hearing this and say, but Josh, you don't understand. My, my life is at capacity. I don't have the ability to care for others this way. I have poured myself into so many different things. I don't have more energy to pour myself into the church. I'm barely getting by as it is. Listen, if that's true for you, if that's where you're at, here's the blunt reality. You have not prioritized your life as God calls the Christian to prioritize their life. You're not excused Because you've planned poorly, prioritized poorly, positioned your life poorly. Rather, change your life, (laughs) reprioritize as God calls us to. Change your life and priorities. What in your life is to be more important than the bride of Christ? Jesus came down from heaven, took on flesh, lived perfectly in this nasty, sin-laden world, experienced every temptation possible, yet did not sin, then went to the cross, gave his life, was spat upon, scorned, beaten, bruised, scourged, all of those things, a crown of thorns placed on his head, nailed to a cross, crucified, and all of that was just the physical pain, much less the wrath of God poured out for all sins, for all who would believe for all time. Why? So that he might purify his bride. So that he could save you, and not just save you unto him, but save you unto the body of Christ. What should have a greater priority than this? Certainly we have other things in our life that we have to be faithful to. We have to be diligent with. But if it is pushing to the fringe your ability to love one another in the body of Christ, things need to change. Doesn't mean there isn't a place for those things. Doesn't mean there aren't ways to do those things wonderfully, beautifully before the Lord in a way that glorifies him. But if your life is filled to where loving one another in the body is just a fringe reality, you need to change some things in your life. You are called to love one another and loving one another demands time and it demands self-denial. Each one of us should diligently apply ourselves to care and service to the end of seeing each other's spiritual good and fruitfulness. And think about this. In this command, the Lord graciously gives you a part in aiding one another in their spiritual growth and good. How how amazing is that? As you love me well, you contribute to my spiritual good before the Lord. And as I love you well, and you love somebody else well, and it's just happening collectively in the body of Christ, it is a beautiful picture of Christ's love, and we build up one another in Christ. We get to participate in the spiritual good and spiritual growth of one another. What else would you rather commit yourself to?
this kind of reciprocal love for one another, it's to be the aroma of the body of Christ. We exemplify this and strengthen one another in this. I see you doing it for this person. They see me doing it for another and so on. And we're all growing in this. And when you love this way, listen, you aren't discouraged when you're doing this when someone isn't as far along in it yet. Why? Because you know where the Lord's brought you. You're not preoccupied with self. So if someone isn't loving you all the ways that they should yet, you're just eager to love because that's what God's called you to. And you trust the Lord with the inadequacies of others at times, knowing there have certainly been inadequacies on your part as well and mine and so on. You're not prone to grow bitter or impatient with one another. I'm always the one loving others and no one loves me this way. Josh, what if that happens? What if, what if I pour myself out in sacrificial for love for others and I get taken advantage of and people don't do that to me? Can you trust the Lord with that? Do you think your perception is always accurate? Do you think your love is actually selfless if that's going on in your heart and mind? That kind of statement is actually a sure sign that you aren't loving fervently and from the heart. The body is to be overwhelmed by people who aren't looking to preserve and protect themselves. And hey, I'm going to love, but I got to make sure that I get loved back. I'm going to give myself for others, but I got to make sure that others care for me as good as I'm caring for them. No, the body is to be overwhelmed by people who aren't looking to preserve and protect themselves, but are looking to bless and encourage others regardless of the response. We're simply called to love. And now back to this fervently and from the heart phrase. Peter says, love one another fervently. That is to persevere. It's to be diligent in love, eager in love, constantly love one another this way. To fervently love one another is to excel and be consistent in your love for one another. And Peter says, love with this intensity and fervency and and diligence and eagerness and do it from the heart, from your inner self. Command central of who you are, be committed to one another's good regardless of the cost. Sometimes we overemphasize how we feel with our love. Listen, you can feel deep affections for someone and not love them this way. You can feel deep affections for someone and not desire or act unto their good. And this instruction to love from the heart doesn't mean love them emotionally, love them passionately. Rather, it says, regardless of how you feel in your inner man, in your inner being, give of yourself for their good. It actually guards against something that would simply be reduced to emotionalism with one another. It's not that feeling affections for one another is wrong or that that doesn't come with a commitment to love one another sacrificially and biblically, but it doesn't encompass all that it is. We are to give of ourselves from the heart, eagerly, joyfully, with all of who you are, without expectation of anything return. You do this fervently, that is, to the fullest capacity. You extend yourself continually, Stretch yourself out to fervently love is to stretch yourself out to the greatest degree of your capacity and love for one another. And just think about the implications of this on a church. As we grow and mature in this, how might God be be pleased to use a church that is continuously committed collectively to this kind of love for one another? 
Now, Peter gives two reminders to aid us in growing in this kind of love. We've seen the command. Now let's look at the the reminders that help us grow in this kind of love. Peter gives two reminders that stimulate love for one another. Peter knows, as I mentioned before, this isn't our natural inclination. So what is going to help us get there? And especially, as we mentioned, this isn't our natural disposition when things are hard or uncomfortable. So what aids us? What do we need to tell ourselves? What do we need to remind ourselves? What do we need to speak to ourselves when we are struggling to love one another as we ought? Well, first, number one, the first reminder is this. A purified soul produces a sincere love. That is God's intention. That's God's design. A purified soul produces a sincere love. Look at verse 22. Peter says, Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls, that's where we see this purified soul, you've done it for or unto a sincere love of the brethren. Since you've done that, since you've purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, love one another, fervently love one another from the heart. That's the first reminder. Since you've done this, since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, love one another. A purified soul produces a sincere love. Your salvation came to you in love. The love of God was lavished upon you. This love from God, it cleanses you. Your soul is purified if you are in Christ. In your conversion, you became cleansed through and through, as Peter already mentioned, by the precious blood, you are cleansed, you're made clean. And in verse two of chapter one, he says, you were sprinkled with his blood. That is, you have been cleansed. And in this cleansing, You are cleansed from a life of self-worship and you are cleansed unto a life for God's purposes. And those who have been loved by God love as he has loved them. Peter's using salvation language here in verse 22. When he says in obedience to the truth, he means obedience to the gospel, to the truth of the gospel, which what does the gospel call sinners to do? Repent and believe. That's the call from Christ unto salvation. We talked about this in verse 1 and 2. Do you remember it at the beginning of 1 Peter? Look again at verse 1 and 2. Peter starts with saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Pithynia, who are chosen, and he starts going into this rapid fire salvation language. You're chosen, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, how? By the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that is the being set apart, that positional sanctification of the Spirit, to obey Jesus, you've been chosen unto obedience to Jesus. And he's not talking about sanctified obedience there. He's talking about obedience to Jesus' call to repent and believe. And so you've been obedient, you, to, you've been called to obey Jesus and be sprinkled with his blood. Again, he's using this rapid fire salvation language. And sometimes in our good uh, love of God's sovereignty and salvation, we get really uncomfortable when we see obedience coupled with a salvation principle. And that's okay, but God isn't wary of using that kind of language. Not because salvation comes from works. We know that isn't the case. But when God chooses, when God saves, when God regenerates, when God cleanses, God lavishes grace, he lavishes mercy, and he gifts faith. That does what? How does faith express itself? Self-denial, fleeing self-worship, submission and obedience to the call to repent and believe. Every believer's first act of obedience initiated by the saving work of God is to repent and believe in Christ. You're obedient to the call of the gospel. That doesn't earn us our salvation. It's the first expression of it. And it's a gift. 
And so in verse 22, when he says, since you have in obedience to the truth, that is, you've actually come to Christ, repented and believed, you've purified your souls by the work of Christ, you've embraced what he has put before you in the gospel, since you have done this, it's been done for the purpose, God saves us unto his purposes, which include loving one another. It's closely tied to your identity in Christ. If you are a Christian, you're called to love one another. It's what you signed up for. It's a defining characteristic of the Christian to love one another as Christ has loved us. God chose you. He did it according to his foreknowledge. He did it by his cleansing work of the spirit that you would submit and believe in Jesus. And by his grace, you were obedient to this call and obedience to the truth. You purified your souls. That is, you embraced God's saving work unto or for the purpose of or for a sincere love of the brethren. For each Christian to love one another It is ingrained in your DNA as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's what we're called to. It's what we're to be about. We were dead in our trespasses and sins without hope. We were worshipers of self, lost, broken, devastated in our sin, weary under condemnation. God saves you. He loved you when you were his enemy. And in God making you new and purifying you, he did it with divine purpose. An intention. And wrapped up in his purpose and your identity under his great grace and mercy is love for one another. Because of this, love for one another. So when you are struggling to love others, you're being negligent to remember well your own purification. God saved you from self-love. He saved you from self-focus. He saved you from being fixated on how everything affects you, from all of that selfishness. And when you contemplate the love of God in Christ, how could you not want to pour out yourself for others? We can get so caught up in our own minds doubting God's grace to us, doubting his faithfulness, worrying about this life, fixating on our struggles and our trials, focused on what others are doing wrong or how they aren't meeting our needs. And God says, remember your purification. Remember your purification. Stop thinking of yourself and deliberately and comprehensively from your inner being, love one another. Remember what you've been given. Stop acting as if you're a victim here in this life. If you are a follower of Christ, you have received infinitely more than you could ever give. And so give generously. When you have a hard time loving others, God calls you to remember you have been purified. You were once filthy at the heart level. He washed you. He cleansed you. And this cleansing actually comes with a a pure love. And so embrace that and live that out and trust God. And I love what Peter does here. He says, since you have purified yourselves for a sincere love of the brethren, and here in love of the brethren, he uses a different word for love when he references love of the brethren than in the command to love one another. In love of the brethren, he uses the word Philadelphia. This is the word for brotherly love, familial love. As we're purified unto a sincere brotherly love, as we are part of the same family, we are children of obedience as we're saved into this. In light of that love, a different word for your love is then used, agape, love one another. Because of your purification unto familial relations, which produces family-like affection for each other, because of this, remembering of this, Give of yourself for one another's good sacrificially. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We were purified unto this brotherly familial affection for one another. Because of that, love one another sacrificially for each other's good. We're part of the same household. 
Love one another and your fuel for this or an aid to this is remembering that a purified soul produces a sincere love. And next, number two, remember that the living word produces a fervent love. Thank you for bearing with me. I feel fine. It's just allergies and talking too much. I know it's hard to believe that I would ever talk too much, but it's finally happened. Look at verse 23. The living word produces a fervent love. The living word produces a fervent love. Uh, Verse 23, Peter says, for you have been born again. So love one another, fervently love one another from the heart for you have been born again. Not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That that is through the living and enduring word of God. Again, an aid in loving one another is remembering identity level realities. You were born again through the living and enduring word of God. And this living word produces this comprehensive, fervent love from the inner man. Uh, Turn to 1 John, or to John, the gospel of John. Turn to the left. You can keep your hand in 1 Peter But turn to John chapter 1 for just a moment. John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then jump down to verse 9. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those were his own, did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God. This is the the work of the word. You were born again. You became a child of God because of the word of God. It, It wasn't your own doing. It wasn't your works. It wasn't your ideas or strategies, your resources that you were born again because of. It was the word of God, Jesus in the flesh. That is how you became his child. And Peter appeals in his command to love one another to the purification that you've received and to the new life that you've been given through the word. He appeals to the seed that is in you. It is an eternal seed. He says you are born again, not of seed which is perishable. It's not temporal, it's eternal. Look at verse 23, back in 1 Peter. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable. You've been born again rather of seed that is imperishable. What is this imperishable seed? It's the living, it's been accomplished through the living and enduring word of God. Peter says, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. It is spiritual, it is eternal, it is enduring, it is otherworldly, it is supernatural. That's what we've been born of. You've been born again through the divinely powerful work that was rooted in love and that divinely empowered work to save you in love. It also is then to spur on and it enables divinely powered supernatural love for one another. That's what Peter's getting at here. The world can feel affections for one another, but the world can't replicate the love that is to be present in the church. There is to be such an unawareness of self in each individual and such a commitment to the good of others. It's profound. It's not, you can't replicate it outside of the church because it's empowered by divine eternal seed, the living word of God. How does this affect our thinking? Ah, been a busy week, too tired. I'll just watch online. 
I'm tired. My life is full. I, 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 don't, want, I don't want my church time to be out about serving. I need to be recharged. What is that thinking about? Who is that thinking centered upon? Maybe there's a lack of prioritizing one another interactions in the local body. Why? What if each of us as family sat down with our family and said, okay, here are our obligations in life. Here are the commitments that we have. These ones, well, we just have to do them. These ones are negotiable. Which things would fall into those non-negotiable categories? Is loving one another in that non-negotiable category? I think there's oftentimes a, a tendency to be incredibly reactive in how we think about body life in the church and how we think about serving one another. I've got all these things I'm committed to and where there's margins and there's needs and those things fall in line perfectly, great, I can fulfill my obligation to love one another. That's not what Peter's talking about here. This kind of fervent love for one another from the heart, it takes an element of deliberance. Is that a word? Being deliberate. <laughs> it, it requires intentionality. Careful, intentional, thoughtful commitment to love one another. Have have we so reduced the margins in our life with activities and commitments that I'm, that I'm just unable to love one another right now? That would be a sad place to be. That is a sad place to be. It's not what God intends. And listen, this takes wisdom. It takes discernment. It takes self-control. It takes prayerful consideration. Don't be reactive in this. Be proactive. Don't, don't simply navigate life as it comes and then squeeze in love for others where it works. You were born of eternal divine seed unto this love. To live as if it is negotiable or negligible is to live outside of the very purpose for which you were saved. This love loves when it's not initiated externally. It loves with difficult people to love. It loves those who are hard to love. It loves sacrificially, without expectation in return, without holding grudges. This love actually baffles the world. They look and they, they, can't, they can't explain it. Why? Because we've been born of God. His seed abides in us. He planted it there. He made us alive. The, the world loves with self-love. The world's love lacks this seed. It isn't in faith. Any love that the world tries to replicate, it's not in faith. It's, it's not for God's glory. It's not empowered by God's supernatural means. At best, it's superficial and temporal. We may get glimpses of this kind of care because, listen, we are humans. We're made in the image of God, even though we've marred it drastically in our sinful, wayward rebellion. It's not all that God intends for those who don't know Christ. It's not eternal. Any love by an unbeliever is a love for human reasons. It's not motivated out of the love that we've received from God. But for the believer, you were born by the living and enduring word of God. Our call to love one another is to be motivated by the reality that we have been loved by the living and enduring word of God. You've been loved and born again by the eternal God, and thus your love, it is to endure and it's to persist, and it, it goes on, and the implications of it span into eternity. And so you love when it's hard and you love when you're taken advantage of and you don't grow embittered, you persevere, you don't hold accounts of wrongs suffered. You don't hold in your heart, I'm gonna do this, but if I get overlooked one more time or if I get taken advantage of one more time, that's it, I'm out. There's no room for that. 
Listen, there, there's simply no way you could outlove others in relation to the love that you received from God. So whatever extreme measures that you go to to show love for one another, you've barely scratched the surface in the love that you've received from Christ. So don't, don't think highly of yourself. Hey, you don't know all the ways I love. Josh, you're really pressing things home here. Well, first of all, it's Peter. He's calling us to do this. And secondly, you have a small view of God's love if you think your love is something to talk about. It just never compares. God's love is that extreme, that majestic, that mysterious, that intense. And so love. And Peter's point here about the enduring word of God is this. If you were born of this seed of the living and enduring word of God that doesn't fade, it never ends, it's eternal, then your love for one another, it should do the same. It should not fade and it should know no ends. This kind of supernatural enabled love of God that we show to one another, it is powerful. The love that God gives to the believer and when Christians love one another like this, that is supernatural. That is shocking. It is profoundly edifying for the church when we love this way. We've all experienced it in beautiful ways, even in this body, in the short time of our existence. So much giving of self for the benefit to make body life happen, ministry happen one to another, takes place every week. Giving, serving, coming early, going home, then coming back again, setting up signs, breaking down signs, setting up classrooms, setting up communion trays, overseeing ministries. All of this happens weekly, not to mention the connection to one another that comes with Intentional questions, prayer, encouragement, sharing what you're reading, spurring one another on towards love and good deeds, hospitality, sharing meals, provisions, giving generously to support gospel ministry in this church. Love abounds and we benefit from it. Let's not take our foot off the accelerator. I think we have too many people with electric cars to say gas. Let's keep going. God uses this love in powerful ways. We are already seeing that in a, a little over a year of existence. We have been sanctified because of this reciprocal love that we have one another, have for one another. We've been edified. Why? Because it's, it's the divine word of God working itself out in our life. This is the word of God. It's living and active. It divides the intentions of the heart. The word of the Lord, it is pure, righteous. It endures. It has power. It is so distinct, so unique. And that's what Peter draws attention to. In citing Isaiah 40, he says, temporal things, the flesh, it's like grass and it's it's glory, it's like flower, the flower of grass. It's here today, dies tomorrow. This kind of Worldly love, worldly things that you're preoccupied with or devoted to, comes and goes, fades away, here today, gone tomorrow. The word of the Lord that dwells within you, that spurs on this kind of love, it never changes, it never ceases, it never ends, never loses beauty, never loses power. It's enduring. And so don't live contrary to that which you've been born of by living an empty life of love. Listen, how helpful is this reminder of the fact that you've been born of the enduring word of God and spurring us on to love one another. When you are faced with trials and all you can see is the hardship that's right in front of you, how would your thinking change if you remember, I've been born again with an eternal living seed of God, the word of God, he dwells in me. He's given to me a love that no worldly explanation can come up with. 
And he's given me a love to love others with a lasting, supernatural, powerful love that he uses for his people's good and for his glory, as well as my good. Do you really think something so temporal or short-sighted as a trial or a hardship can undo who you are in Christ? We often succumb to selfishness in the heat of the trial. And praise God that there's grace because we, we need it. But we should desire and we should strive and we should labor to live according to that which we have been saved by. We can have confidence to live this way. Why? Because of the work of God in us. It abides, his word abides in you because you were born of imperishable seed. So when temporal things happen, it doesn't derail you because you were birthed and are being upheld by eternal divine power. Persecution, hardship, physical pain, verbal abuse, physical resources being taken away. Do you really think those things are significant in light of what you have received from God in Christ? It's not to make light of hardships. They're hard. They're weighty. But this kind of thinking holds them in their proper place compared to eternity. How did Paul view trials? Momentary light affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory. The worst man can do is but for a moment. What you have been given in Christ lasts into eternity, cannot be taken away, rust cannot destroy, moth cannot take away, fire cannot burn up. You have the living, enduring word in you. You are upheld by the eternal power of God. This is why Peter's going to go on to say, put off the old manner of life that lives at opposition with one another in chapter two, verse one. Put, put away things like malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Those obstruct your love for one another. In contrast, crave the word. Crave your Bible. Cra crave truth. You were born of it. It enhances your love. Put aside what would dull your craving for that which produces love in you. Your life of usefulness to the Lord, this defining characteristic of the believer, it is supernatural, so live it out. And listen, it is so unique that when we love one another, Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this, your love for one another, all men will know that you are my disciples. That's how unique this reciprocal love that we are to possess for one another is. It is an identifying mark of the fact that we love Jesus. And so let's embrace it. Let's get after it. And why can we love? Why can we do this? Well, because he first loved us. And when we think rightly about our state apart from Christ, as we remember frequently from Romans 5, he sa Paul says it so clearly, helpless, godless sinners, enemies of God at enmity with God. In that state, God demonstrated his love for us. To what extent? Our good at the most extreme cost he sent his son. That is a captivating love. We've received it. He's our example, our perfect example, this love in Christ. And so, listen, remember your purification. Remember what God's love in Christ has provided for you. Remember that with which you were born of. Not perishable, temporal things, eternal things, and let that fuel us, let that drive us to self-giving, consistent, perpetual, comprehensive giving of ourselves for one another's good, regardless of the cost. Listen, there's no cost that even comes close to the cost that God was willing to give in his own son's blood. When this happens, it is a beautiful, beautiful 
picture of Christ, his love for us, it puts on display that we are his and it is God's means of grace in one another's lives to be built up, to be strengthened. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. You call us to love, and yet, Lord, just to ponder the depths of your love is overwhelming. We can't fully comprehend how you have shown to us such favor and kindness and goodness that you would crush your son on our behalf. Lord, may we never lose sight of this truth. And as we intentionally remember these things, I pray that it would increase our love for you and it would fuel our love for one another. Help Gilbert Bible Church to be a church that is defined by a love for Jesus and a love for one another. Thank you for the ways that you are already working in our lives to this end. Thank you for the fruitfulness that you've already produced. Help us to abound and increase all the more in genuine love for one another, for your glory and for your purposes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.